In this video, I'll be quoting from Carl Jung's book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections, where he writes about Nietzsche, his book Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and his fall into madness, but also the public response of his work when he was a university student in Zurich. As I quote, The clinical semesters that followed kept me busy, that scarcely any time remained for my forays into outlying fields. I was able to study Kant only on Sundays. I also read Edward von Hartmann assiduously. Nietzsche had been on my program for some time, but I hesitated to begin reading him because I felt I was insufficiently prepared. At that time he was much discussed, mostly in adverse terms, by the allegedly competent philosophy students, from which I was able to deduce the hostility he arose in the higher echelons. The supreme authority, of course, was Jakob Burkhardt, whose various critical comments on Nietzsche were bandied about. Moreover, there were some persons at the university who had known Nietzsche personally and were able to retail all sorts of unflattering tidbits about him. Most of them had not read a word of Nietzsche and therefore dwelt at length on his outward foibles. For example, his putting on airs as a gentleman, his manner of playing the piano, his stylistic exaggerations, idiosyncrasies, which got on the nerves of the good people of Basel. Such things would certainly not have caused me to postpone the readings of Nietzsche. On the contrary, they acted as the strongest incentive, but I was held back by a secret fear that I might perhaps be like him, at least in regard to the secret which had isolated him from his environment. Perhaps, who knows, he had had an inner experience, insights which he had unfortunately attempted to talk about and had found that no one understood him. Obviously he was, or at least was considered to be an eccentric, a sport of nature, which I did not want to be under any circumstances. I feared I might be forced to recognise that I too was another such strange bird. Of course he was a professor, had written whole long works, and so had attained unimaginable heights, but like me, he was a clergyman's son. He, however, had been born in the great land of Germany, which reached as far as the sea. While I was only a Swiss and sprang from a modest parsonage in a small border village, he spoke a polished high German, new Latin and Greek, possibly French, Italian and Spanish as well, whereas the only language I commanded, with any certainty, was the waggish Basel dialect. He, possessed all these splendours, could well afford to be something of an eccentric, but I must not let myself find out how far I might be like him. In spite of these trepidations, I was curious and finally resolved to read him. Thoughts Out of Season was the first volume that fell into my hands. I was carried away by enthusiasm and soon after read Thus Spake Zarathustra. This, like Goethe's Faust, was a tremendous experience for me. Zarathustra was Nietzsche's Faust. His number two and my number two now corresponded to Zarathustra, though this was rather like comparing a molehill with Mount Blanc. And Zarathustra, there could be no doubt about it, was morbid. Was my number two also morbid? This possibility filled me with a terror, which for a long time I refused to admit, but the idea cropped up again and again at inopportune moments, throwing me into a cold sweat so that in the end I was forced to reflect on myself. Nietzsche had discovered his number two only later in life, when he was already past middle-aged, whereas I had known mine ever since boyhood. Nietzsche had spoken naively and incautiously about his aretum, this thing not to be named, as though it was quite in order. But I had noticed in time that this only leads to trouble. He was so brilliant that he was able to come to Basel as a professor when a still young man, not suspecting what lay ahead of him. Because of this very brilliance, he should have noticed in time that something was amiss, that I thought was his morbid misunderstanding, that he fearlessly and unsuspectingly let his number two loose upon a world that knew and understood nothing about such things. He was moved by the childish hope of finding people who would be able to share his ecstasies and could grasp his transvaluation of all values. He was only himself, like the rest of them, he did not understand himself when he fell ahead first into the unutterable mystery and wanted to sing its praises to the dull, godforsaken masses. That was the reason for the bombastic language, the piling up of metaphors, the hymn-like raptures, all a vain attempt to catch the end of a world which had sold its soul for a mass of disconnected facts. And he fell, tightrope walker that he proclaimed himself to be, into depths far beyond himself. He did not know this way about in this world, and was like a man possessed, 
one who could be handled only with the utmost caution. Among my friends and acquaintances, I knew of only two who openly declared themselves adherents of Nietzsche. Both were homosexual. One of them ended up committing suicide. The other ran to seed as a misunderstood genius. The rest of my friends were not so much dumbfounded by the phenomenon of Zarathustra as simply immune to its appeal. But as Faust had opened a door for me, Zarathustra slammed one shut, and it remained shut for a long time to come. End quote. Jung then starts talking about his communications with his unconscious, but then goes on to the topic that it was essential for him to ground himself in all this that was counterpoised to that of his strange inner world. He then links this to Nietzsche and to his fall into madness. As I quote, It was most essential for me to have a normal life in the real world as a counterpoise to that strange inner world. My family and my profession remained the base to what I could always return, assuring to me that I was an actually existing, ordinary person. The unconscious contents could have driven me out of my wits, but my family and the knowledge, I have a medical diploma from a Swiss university, I must help my patients, I have a wife and five children. These were actualities which had demanded upon me and proved to me again and again that I really existed. That I was not a blank page, whirling about in the winds of the spirit like Nietzsche. Nietzsche had lost the grounds under his feet because he possessed nothing more than the inner world of his thoughts, which incidentally possessed him more than he it. He was uprooted and hovered above the earth and therefore he succumbed to exaggeration and irreality. For me, such irreality was the quintessence of horror, for I aimed, after all, at this world and this life. No matter how deeply absorbed or how blown about I was, I always knew that everything I was experiencing was ultimately directed at this real life of mine. I meant to meet its obligations and fulfil its meanings. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, comment and subscribe. I'll be doing more videos in the future on Carl Jung, philosophy, psychology and symbolism.